What's going on, guys? It's been a while since I've done a, a YouTube video, but um, basically, I'm you know I'm trying a little something new. Uh, my name is Drew Dennis. If you just joined now, uh, I'm a graphic designer, um, you know, art major. I do a little indie comics on the side, mostly coloring, lettering, and uh, today I'm you know joined with Brendan Wagner. And I really you know introduce yourself, man. The people I don't know. Howdy, guys. Uh, I'm a digital painter, illustrator colorist um i've been doing this stuff since i could walk uh i'm the son of legendary creator matt wagner whose most notable fame is uh grendel and mage um grendel through dark horse mage through image but um he's done everything from batman to wonder woman and in between so um i've virtually grown up in this world and and walked these convention halls my entire life and um coloring coloring something i sort of fell into and uh it's uh, it's why i'm on the show today i i uh, just put out a a good uh, batman book with tim sale and jeff Loeb, and we'll Got talk right about that in a little bit yep long halloween special um, so um yeah, man, uh, I really appreciate you coming out with me, you know, just to talk comics, talk coloring, you know, uh, really appreciate it. Um, basically, you know, got a couple questions. So uh, first off, you know, how did you get into coloring comics? How'd that begin? Uh, like most colorists, I didn't grow up thinking I was going to color somebody else's work. Uh, obviously, it's something that um, you you sort of fall into. Uh, I, I certainly stumbled into it. Um, I grew up drawing pen and ink, uh, traditionally pencil, um, seeing the work of my father and his peers, Tim Sale, uh, Walt Simonson, you know, um, Art Adams, all, all these guys who are, they're really accomplished uh, in terms of, of pen and ink and, and thinking in line, um, creating images uh, by contour and by line detail. Um, but it wasn't until high school that I started to take some graphic design courses, some digital art courses, and um, and coloring other people's inked work just kind of fell into my lap. Um, I, you know, I was around so much of it at the time. Um, and again, this is sort of the end of high school, beginning of college. I was, I was seeing the way that other people were treating line art at the time and coloring it. And I thought to myself, um, I could do better than that, or or I could do I could do as good, um, at the at the very least. And so, um, one of my first opportunities was a Sherlock Holmes gig through Dynamite Comic Books. And so this was a a big stepping stone for me, and and was um, sort of a test really to see if I was competent enough to take on uh, the next book through them which was the shadow year one and this this one was with my dad writing matt wagner and with artist wilfredo torres on line art and this was a big responsibility this was something that um taking on was not um not something i could i could you know take my time on this this was something that i i had to hit hard deadlines monthly it was a 12 issue book and um, I had never really dealt with that before. So that was really, that's really what got me into coloring was those first two solid books. I had done a little short story before that for Dark Horse, um, uh, the Fish Police, the Fish Police BC, which wow. everything <laughs> back in the, in the 90s had to be animal something uh, in the success of the Ninja Turtles. So, you know, it was, it was Fish Police, but this issue was like, bc version so it was like fish police that are also dinosaurs that are cops <laughs> so, weird. so weird but but uh but it, you know i was given the the gig by my my aunt diana uh my aunt uh diana schutz is a legendary editor in her own right over at dark horse uh she's now freelance but um she honestly she's one of the most uh uh, respected and well-known editors in the industry. Um, and that would be, that's my aunt on my mom's side. She's actually okay. how my parents met. Oh, wow. That's cool. Wow. She was editing my dad's books back in the day, Grendel and such. Um, she's done a ton of work. She was Frank Miller's editor for many years. Um, 
wow. she, they're close friends and and she she's done a lot of work she brought black sad over here she discovered the the Gab, gabrielle bod fabio moon and brought them over here to the states as well um, got them you know sort of hooked up at dark horse and uh and she's been really great for me over the years too having the, those connections uh shout out to you auntie die i love cool. you <laughs> Now, uh, are you self-taught or did, did you go to art school like in college? Did you know, did you, you know, maybe one of your dad's peers, did they like mentor you um, or, or is this kind of just like a crash test kind of thing, you know, like just see what works, you know, and kind of slowly adapt and talk a little bit about that. Um, yeah. Um, so obviously growing up around it and, and um, he didn't always have a studio in the house, my father, but um, I think, you know, around the age of like, six or seven or something, he, he, they built a studio in the basement. And so I really got a lot of exposure there. And it's not as if I got like one-on-one -on -one drawing lessons per se from him. Um, he would occasionally show me how to maybe correct a hand here and there, or hands are notoriously difficult to draw. Oh, um, this, totally, yeah. Everyone knows. Um, or he would show me, you know, uh, maybe, maybe draw it in, in this, from this angle instead and do like, he would do like a little sketch or something. He, he, he would help me in those ways over the years, but honestly it was just being around it and being interested in it because I have a sister and she doesn't draw and she's not interested in it. And she, she, you know, that that's, she has a decent understanding of the comic book world, just having grown up in it, but it took having that exposure and also wanting to pursue it that allowed me to get to this point. Um, so I, I, you know, took a lot of art classes, um, but, uh, and I did go to college. Um, I went to several different schools. I started at Southern Oregon University in Ashland, Oregon. Uh, okay. Then I went north and I came back up to Portland. I grew up in the uh, suburbs of Portland. Uh, and I went to school at PSU, Portland State University. And um, I took a bunch of art classes, but ultimately I was filling my schedule with uh, just life drawing courses. And most, most people that work in comic books will tell you that is one of the more important classes to take um, is art drawing courses, art, art or live, live drawing courses, nudes, um, life painting, life sculpting. Um, the human figure is still the hardest thing to, to draw and to paint. And so um, getting an understanding of that is, is really important for a budding comic book illustrator, colorist, what have you. Um, but ultimately I was just taking too much of that. And so I dropped out and I dropped out because I knew I was ready to just start doing this stuff professionally. And, um, and so like the, around that time, around the time of dropping out is when I really started to get those, those good gigs, the, the shadow year one. Um, and after the shadow year one, again, that's 12 issues. And that one really, it, it's hundreds of pages. And that really allowed me to step up in terms of like quality, quantity, um, hitting deadlines, uh, which is a big part of comic books. You know, this is not art that sits on a wall. Th this right. is art that is read very quickly. And yeah. so if the reader's gonna dwell on a panel for 10 seconds, you shouldn't dwell on it for 10,000 hours. <laughs> totally, oh yeah, it that should, makes sense. It should be something that, that um, you do and you move on with. The most important thing is to capture the storytelling elements. Does it help push the narrative? And as a colorist, that's something that I'm always trying to um, think about first and foremost. If I'm starting to get too lost in detail or too lost in um, fussy, fussy rendering, um, I will pull back, pause and assess and remind myself, you know, is this helping to tell the story? If not, do that storytelling focus and move on next next storytelling element next next because there's a time element here there's you know this this stuff moves this stuff is kinetic oh totally yeah no i i kind of I, I totally get what you mean because when i did my comic um it's called the price hero phase and you know i would spend hours working on a page that had very little dialogue so it was just mm. kind of like wow yep. like this is literally someone's taking a second to flip through this when i spent like probably three or four hours working on it right so i totally get that right. it makes so much sense you know and it's just kind of and that's another thing I wanted to ask you is like, do you feel like and on and on the and hold on really quick. Oh, let yeah, me, yeah. Let me say on the okay. dialogue pages as well. You'll spend time there and it's just covered up by dialogue balloons. 
Oh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so you all, so really, you always want to be just, just moving along on this stuff. The reader, the reader is not going to dwell on your art that long. Now, um, you know, when, when you do a project, do you find yourself kind of looking through it? Uh, I know you, you've said before, I've, I've watched another interview with you and you said, you know, you don't have time to revisit pages, redo pages. Do you find yourself going through and saying, is this consistent in terms of like, you know, maybe putting too much detail into it, too little? Going through you, what, like the whole, the whole book before it yeah, hits like, the shelf? Or? Like say like, you know, you're looking through the whole book that you colored and is it like one of those things where like, is this consistent? Do I have the consistent style all along these pages? Or is it kind of one of those things where you've gotten better where it's like, you don't even need to go back? Well, like I was saying with most of these books, they're published first monthly as floppies, right? right. So, so you don't have you don't have the chance to, to yeah, uh, on, the time, on issue yeah. 12 i can't look back on issue one and say oh these are a little inconsistent issue one hit the shelves 12 months ago right. <laughs> 11 yeah. months ago yeah. so um so it doesn't matter so yeah yeah i don't look back very much and i don't think most successful comic book artists do they 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 plow ahead um uh even on an issue man because i uh, some colorists work in like whole issues. They'll turn in the whole issue. Um, I work pretty closely with my line artists and most colorists that are successful do, they team up with line artists. I, I don't really work with publishers and editors. I work with the line artists. Like first and foremost, I, I respond to them and I, I'm almost like an assistant to the line artist. Um, gotcha. I, I, you know, they, they get priority. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to build good relationships with line artists and then make them concrete so they last for years, you know, um, oh, totally. be reliable, someone who can, who, who is, who wants to work with them and not just like dump a bunch of work on their lap last, last second. So I send in pages one at a time to my gotcha. line artists. Yeah. And we check, we check back and forth. Um, I used to get more notes than I do now. And with a new line artist, I'll get more notes to begin with than with an established line artist that I have a connection with because we're trying to establish a look. And then once the look gets comfortable and I'm comfortable with their work, let's say with my father or with Tim Sale, who I've been coloring for like five, six years now, um, we were doing cover work until, until this long Halloween book. Uh, yeah. You develop a style, you develop a look, and over time they just learn to trust you. And that's what you're building up is trust, really, with right. the line artist as a colorist. You're, you're building up the trust so that they can rely on you. And for a lot of the guys that I work with, uh, like Tim, um, if they send me something that's like a single image, like a cover, pretty much drop whatever I'm working on so that I can turn it over like overnight. Uh, because that is, uh, that's, that's what they want. <laughs> right. Totally, um, and yeah. sometimes, sometimes they're slow or something and they, they've turned it in pretty last minute or they had to, they had to revise it and do it several different times. And so they'll turn it in and they, they're like, ah, we need it, you know, uh, next week or tomorrow or whatever. And so I'll just do it very quickly because single pieces are always, yeah, it's always good to just like kind of just do it right away. Um, but yeah, the, the, the whole book is, 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 uh, a commitment. And it is, um, it's a project, but um, it's also something that is individual pieces. Each page is its own piece of art. And um, over time you get a consistent look too, and, and you don't worry so much about your final page looking inconsistent from your first page. You just know that it's going to be because you, you always render a certain way. So your work just starts right. to look, I mean, I've been doing this for, 11 years now and every you know now when i color a page i i'm confident enough to know that that um it's gonna have a similar palette i'm not even the kind of guy who really saves palettes and has like these definitive sort of palettes right. established in photoshop um i love how photoshop i can just use whatever color i want and i'm often totally. adjusting the final image too with like um levels and with hue satch and with um you know uh, uh CMYK and stuff. I'm often adjusting these little levels layer uh, uh, later on to to get a, a more cohesive final image. So for me, it's not worth the time to to save swatches. And some guys do that, but um, right. just kind of you know. And if I open up, um, if I screen share with you here, and just were to open up like a whole issue on 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 uh, Bridge 
where I organize all my images, we would see just a whole ridiculous um, amount of color because I, I, I like color and I like a lot of it. <laughs> right. Um, you know, real quick, uh, and then we'll have you, you know, share your screen and we'll take a look at some of the art. Um, do you have any you know, artists right now that you admire, um, you know, past, present? Pop color artists? Um, you know, just general, like, line artists that, like, you, you know, you like their work and you would love to work with them. Any, like, dream collaborators you'd, you know, love to do color with? A Anyone? ton. Yeah. It, it's hard to, it's hard to nail it down. I mean, I, my, uh, my Instagram, for example, is just filled with line artists that I'm trying to work with. And, um, and I'll message them. I'll send them, you know, examples of my work. In general, they, they follow me too. So it's like, okay. they know my work. And we, uh, right. for example, uh, uh, a fellow by the name of Chris Samney, my God, can that guy draw? Oh, yeah, um, yeah. And so I've been wanting to work with him for a really long time. And I just, I can tell that my style would match with his. I, I just, I just know because he's inspired by the same kind of guys that my dad is inspired by that, that Tim Sale is inspired by that you know, uh, various artists that I've worked with are inspired by and, and, uh, they, they come from the same house style, you know, oh, yeah. um, which is chunky, totally. chunky, uh, ink work. I don't like to work with guys that produce a lot of line art, the sort of Jim Lee house style. That art is fine in its own right. And there are plenty of colorists who love to work on that stuff and are great at it. I don't think I'm one of them. Um, I work a lot better when I'm thinking about, um, simple design choices and making the right color choices rather than uh, fussing and and spending a lot of time rendering and some guys do and and that's and it's very accomplished and, and cool looking and you can follow their rendering and it's uh, it's impressive uh, and it, it can often look very realistic and that's that's very cool as well um, again I'm not so much in that house uh, I'm trying to the produce hyper work realistic. That is, not, not surreal. So much a yeah, yeah. The more, surreal. More so, the, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm in the surreal. They want the hyper real. I want the surreal. I want the, the, um, I'm going for work that is, uh, like of the impressionists, um, right. stuff that, uh, totally. it gives the impression of things rather than the realistic, um, representation of things. Um, you know, the first person that comes to mind is like, uh, David, I believe, I believe it's pronounced uh, Aja. He did like Matt Fraction, Hawkeye, very simple kind of. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I like his stuff. Yeah, I, I could see you kind of working with an artist kind of like that. You know what I mean? Um, like you said, it's, yeah. you know, you know, impressionistic. Yeah, I follow David online I, and I, I, I think I've reached out to him. Um, yeah, my, I love his work. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, guys like Jorge Fornos. Um, he did Rorschach, yeah, said, yeah. Samney or like Doc Shaner, Evan Shaner. Um, it, there, there's a large list of them. So it's, it's kind of hard for me to nail one down because I would love, and for the same reason that coloring, you know, is fun because you get to adapt to different styles and different line artists. I'd want to work with a bunch of different style guys as well. I don't think, I don't, I don't just want to work with the, the one kind my whole life. Um, uh, but yeah, those are, those are definitely some that, that come to mind. Oh yeah. Cool. Well, uh, you know, if you want to share your screen, let's take a look at, you know, some of your art. Now, how many layers do you usually run with, you know, when you, uh, you know, you're coloring a, a page? Do you kind of keep it simple so, or do you do it? You got a couple. So we'll see here, but I am, I am um, of the sort of classically paint trained uh, school that um, I like to use as few layers as possible and as few brushes as possible. Because I think that this is gonna help you to retain the most uh, classic paint look. Um, I work with my ink in the top layer on multiply. What we're gonna do is look at a Batman page here um, from the Long Halloween uh series and we'll take a look at i'm gonna put this little thing out of the way we're gonna take a look at my layers and my brushes so oh so you can see off to the right here uh but my screen is being shared now yeah yeah yep i can see it you can see off to the right here that i've got my layers they're extremely few um the first layer to begin with is the scanned inks these are straight from Tim or DC. I can't remember who sent these to me, but they've not been formatted yet. 
And by that, I mean the inks are as they were when they were scanned. You can see yep. all the little textures, all the gray pixels. Um, it's, it has not been formatted. So the first step is to format these inks. And to format the inks is pretty simple. I'm gonna go up to image adjustment levels. I'm gonna fuss with these levels, which will, um, which will determine how much white and black uh, contrast is going on. Uh, but then to, to finish that off, I will go and I will hit image adjustment threshold. Now threshold, uh, you can also adjust the amount of threshold going on. And uh, as you do it, you'll notice the difference of a high threshold and the low. But the, the point is that the end result will give you something that is pure black and white pixels with nary a gray pixel to be found. And the point of that is that when I'm going to turn a line, let's say it's the line of the bat signal here or the line of the cloud lines here. Let's say I wanna turn that line into a color. It's a heck of a lot easier to do if all of the pixels are black because if they're all black, I can simply color range, select black, and then I have all my black pixels. And what I'm gonna do is just go to the layer right above those inks and I'm just gonna turn them into a color. And uh, by doing that in its own layer, I can fuss with it. I can, I can adjust that, that color if I want to. I can uh, desaturate it. Um, I, can, I can make it brighter. I can, I can make it darker. Uh, the point is that I can now fuss with it and it's in its own layer. But other than my knock, those are called knockout lines or KO lines. Uh, if I'm not, um, or holding lines, there's a bunch of different terms for them. Uh, if I'm uh, not working on my holding lines, I'm generally working underneath the line art. And the first thing to do to set that up is to flat the work. So these are what my flats look like. And these are actually adjusted flats. Usually when I get my flats from my flatter, they're very strange colors, uh, neon greens, strange yellows, pinks, whatever, you know, uh, Gordon will be like look like an alien because uh, the whole point of that is I don't want my flatter to influence the choices that I'm going to make here in the color stage. So the first step I do is I get these flats from him and then I just with a paint bucket tool I just start going through and dropping in colors that I want. I'll go up here again to the image adjustments and I'll color balance maybe and get get sort of a, a cohesive look, maybe I want my shadows to all be bluish. I'll push the blues or something. Uh, maybe I want my highlights to all be really, really yellow. So I'll push, I'll push these things. And then I start rendering. And rendering is when I use brushes. Uh, the simple step here is that I just copy that layer, that flats layer. And uh, you see, I've already done that here with layer five right there. Um, I'll turn it on. Uh, that layer is my active color layer. And having the flat layer beneath it allows me always to uh, select areas that I want to stay within. Uh, I use the magic wand tool generally, and uh, I just select these things. So let's say it's the sky, I'll select the sky. Now I have the sky selected, and by hiding the little dancing ants, man, those dancing ants are annoying, aren't they? All you have to do is hit Command H to get rid of them. Once, yeah. once they're gone and you're not looking at them, you can start to work in that in that space. And working in that space for me generally, you know, it starts with a, a big old like watercolory sort of brush. Uh, and I, I generally start painting these things in. Uh, I usually go background, middle ground, foreground. Um, I'm trying always to keep it very simple. On Tim's work, a lot more simple than, than with other people's work. Tim's work demands a certain flatness, uh, not complete flatness. As you can see, I've done little little renderings here and there, uh, 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 some sculpting on the skin perhaps, or, or, uh, or some, you know, some cloud lines back there that didn't, that didn't exist uh, in the ink stage. Uh, but, um, or even little watercoloriness inside of the windows here. Um, But the point yeah. is, I like to keep it very simple so that I have my, um, 
and I just there, you saw me turn on my knockout lines. So for those, I went and I, you know, I selected the, the line art and I very carefully um, filled in the, the ones that I wanted. And in this case, it's the bat signal knocked out and the lines of the clouds knocked out so that they don't distract and they can kind of recede in space. Wow. That's awesome, man. That's some cool stuff. You know, it's cool seeing, like, you know, because I, I have the book next to me right now. It's cool seeing, the, you know, the process that you went through with that. You know what I mean? It's like, it's it's really cool. It, it's similar to what I did when I did, you know, my first comic book. But, you know, you, you're a professional, you know, you know what you're doing. Me, it was totally more like a crash, you know, crash course kind of, let's see, you know, what this does. I have a general, you know, I'm pretty efficient with Photoshop. So, you know, a lot of those techniques kind of folded in, but it was definitely kind of trial and error stuff, but it's cool, man. Really cool. Now I'm going to go ahead and open up a page um, <clears throat> that has far more rendering to it. And so we'll, we'll compare the differences between that, something like that and the work that I just showed you on Tim's work. So here, I'm, I'm going to open up some, this is some old work of mine, uh, but it was heavy render work. So uh, this was, uh, hillbilly eric powell's hillbilly and i was working with um a sort of anime inspired line artist by the name of simone de mayo he is awesome uh, um <laughs> italian fella i believe yeah and for his work uh it required a lot of rendering so let's take a look at this page oh yeah this page has a lot of rendering and it's rendered with a lot more painterly brushes all throughout than the work I was just showing you on Tim's work. This stuff definitely takes longer, but it's more forgiving in the color choices stage. The color choices to begin with don't matter as much because you have room and time to render them. Let's say the background here, uh, it, it might have looked strange as a flat color, but I knew that it was going to uh, have a high point of light behind the the focal point here. And I knew that it was going to fade to a darker on the edges. Um, knowing that allows you to sort of, again, be, be rather fast with your choices to begin with when you're rendering something like this. But then, then it takes a lot of rendering time, you know, uh, we'll take here, I'll turn this off so we can have a look, see of uh, what this looked like beforehand. Right, so this gets to me like this. I don't know what that thing is there, <laughs> <laughs> but this gets to me like this. And um, you know, I see something like this, and I'm like, "Wow, that's going to take a while." So I send it to my flatter first, and the flatter, for a percentage of the work that I do, I pay him, and he, uh, and I've been training a new flatter, who's my dear friend. Shout out, uh, Cameron Mazia, uh, Mantis uh, Band, local band. Um, he does my flats now and he uh, returns it to me, you know, um, these actually, this page wasn't flatted by him, but we'll take a look at what his flats, what flats normally look like. These, these flats uh, were from a fella named Krishwan and uh, Krishwan uh, turned in some pretty nice flats here. They're very detailed and which is crucial for line art like this. It adheres to the, the lines very well. It's very exact. And it allow and, and these, colors are not anywhere near what I was going to use, which was great because it helped me disassociate uh, his choices uh, with what I was ultimately going to do. Wow. It's more so like, a, it seems more like a separation, kind of like this is this, this is that, you know. Separating is key with color. Uh, that's, that's one thing that I'm always keeping in mind, and it's definitely sort of a, a philosophy of uh, colorist for line artists here is that we, you know, the line art has done a lot of the heavy lifting. The line art can tell the story without your colors pretty much. So what right. you're trying to do with your colors is just to help enhance the line art. You're trying to uh, help bring focus to certain parts of the line art. You're definitely trying to uh, help push the um, sense of scale and of perspective. So foreground, middle ground, background. These are so important when you're coloring. Um, your background in general should be less contrasty and less saturated than your foreground in general. And your background uh, should get less attention in general than your middle ground and foreground. 
in general <laughs> is not always the case that and none of these are tried and true rules, but rather guidelines. Um, and they help get you going because you can always break these rules as you're going, but the rules and the guidelines help you uh, have a, a, a general format to, to move forward on stuff. And because we talked about production and how this is all really important to just keep moving on work. Um, so I'm gonna close that page. And now I'm gonna show you these three Batman pages. So we looked at that one page. Now, um, I don't always work a single page at a time. Sometimes I work in scenes. And lately I have honestly been working in scenes even though I send work one by one to, to most artists. Um, uh, I also like to work in scenes. So this scene here, these, these are the last three pages of the, the book, Batman yeah. book. And uh, I'm comfortable with showing them here on this interview because they're not very spoilery. They're just right. Gordon and Batman talking on a rooftop. Unless you're seeing the words, you don't really know what's happening here. Um, right. But they're gorgeous pages. So let's take a look at these. They are, uh, 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 they're consistent. Um, these three pages I did virtually at the same time. And uh, that helped me keep it consistent. I pretty much did all the backgrounds at the same time. And you can see here, I'll turn off the, um, I'll turn off the top layer and, my, and any knockout lines. So we can take a look at the first uh, lay-in of color. Now I got the flats back from my flatter and they looked neon and strange. And the first thing I did was I went through and I just, on all three of these pages, I just laid in these very simple muted sort of bluish, gray, purple, lavender colors, uh, because I knew that I wanted the scene to look like this. I wanted this palette. And where did I get this palette from? I can't remember. Maybe I pulled something offline and I was like, ooh, I like those colors. And I used an eyedropper tool. Sometimes I'll do that. Sometimes I'll literally just Google like Dave Stewart, awesome fucking Mike Mignola awesomeness. <laughs> and I'll just like use my eyedropper tool and grab some cool colors. Um, I don't always uh, do that, but sometimes if I'm in, in a stump, I'll, or, you know, I, I can't really think of what to do to start. I'll just grab some, a quick palette to start. Cause honestly, no one's going to call you out on like stealing their palette. This is all right. just yeah. uh, color is, is, you know, no one has a, no one has a patent on color. So, um, totally. so, go, so do that when you're coloring, if you know, grab other people's colors because your subject matter and the line weight of the work that you're working on is always going to be different than what you're sampling from. And so, it's going to look different. It's going to require different attention from you. You, you can't leave it literally the exact same as, as the colors you were sampling from because it will look wrong, not, not yeah. cohesive. Um, so in, in these three pages, I, I laid in my colors. Uh, I right away, I started knocking out some lines. I knew I wanted to knock out the, uh, the, the cloud lines back here got knocked out. Um, the, the moon line gets knocked out. Um, and that, that's it actually. And I knew I wanted those knocked out. So I knocked those out right away. And then rendering this stuff was pretty simple. Um, I knew that I wanted, let's take a look at this Batman page. I knew that I wanted, um, minimal rendering on Batman here. I wanted him to be dark because, uh, the background was going to be dark. So he had to be really dark to stand out against an already dark background. Right. And then the little, the little highlights I wanted to be warm ish because I wanted them to be um, uh, uh, as if the light is bouncing off of, coming from the moon, the warm moon, harvest moon, and bouncing off of the clouds. And they would cast these little warm lights. And that's what we're seeing here, just these little warm attention to detail. There, it, it's not everywhere. And picking and choosing where to do it and having a restrained hand with work like this is crucial. With Tim's work, I'm constantly telling myself, uh, K-I-S-S, keep that shit simple. <laughs> I like it. Because, because yeah, it just, it, it needs to. It, if you over-render this stuff, it will look fussed with and it will look wrong. Now, what was going through your head like as you were working on this? Because, you know, The Long Halloween, it's a beloved story. It's probably my favorite Batman story of all time. So what, what was it like getting back into this world? I mean, were, were you a fan of it? Like, you know, you've known Tim Sale for a, a while. You've worked with him in the past. So you understand his art style. But, like, what was it like getting back into this world? 
I also grew up a huge fan of Long Halloween and Dark Victory. Yeah. Um, and I, I always liked Greg's colors, but I have always thought that I could bring something of my own to that. And so I was really excited to to do that. I mean, I've always in my head imagined how I would color something like the Long Halloween. And perhaps that's why I got into coloring in the first place, like I was talking about earlier. I, I remember reading stuff like this and thinking how I would color it. Um, I remember seeing artist editions of stuff like this, of, of Long Halloween and, and other books and, and thinking, oh, so that's what the inks looked like, okay. And really, imagining how uh, the palette that I would have used, the, the rendering that I would have preferred. Um, that's not to say that Greg Wright didn't do a wonderful job coloring those books. And, and most colorists that I was looking at at the time did do wonderful work, but it was, I think it was in looking at that work and, and thinking that I could bring something of my own to it that, that allowed me to just, just leap into it. Um, I, I didn't overthink it too much. Uh, I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, looking, I was, I didn't, I didn't reread it for one. Okay. Yeah. That's what I was uh, but ask. I did I was have like, it open oh. next to me. I did have it open next to me. Um, okay. So that I could reference certain moments or, or if I was in a stump, just, just have a quick peek through again. Um, because I, I was familiar enough with the story. I'd read it several times as a kid. Um, right. And I, I knew, it, I knew it quite well. Um, but yeah, you know, often with this stuff, it's like I'm working on so much of this stuff these days that that frankly, I don't have the time to just go back and read a ton of old material. I kind of just have to go with my gut, so to speak, um, instinct. And and a lot of coloring is that is is just instinct. Do you find yourself like, um, you know, kind of looking at nature to it? Or do you feel like you need, you know, you kind of just need to go with, you know, what's natural to you? Or, you know what I mean? Like, cause you know, like we said before, you're not going for a hyper realistic approach, but do you find yourself kind of looking at, you know, maybe some photos just to get like some, you know, palette ideas or is it, you know, um, what's natural? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, I got to do like roughly one to two pages a day to keep up with this stuff. And when it comes time to crunch time, sometimes it's more like three to four pages and, uh, and frankly, no, you just, I don't have time. I, I, I don't have time to spend a lot of um, time dwelling in the research stage. You kind of just have to, to just roll with it. Uh, research will happen and I will look stuff up if, I, again, I'm in a slump. If I'm not able to, if, I'm, if the instincts aren't good enough, that's when you need to turn to research. But those instincts of yours, you need to trust them. You need to be able to 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 just lay stuff down um, from memory or or just experiment. Especially when you're digitally coloring, there's a lot of time for you to make corrections. If say I'm rendering Batman's the gray part of his suit, right? If say I'm rendering the gray part of his suit here, and I'm doing the highlight line. Oh shit, where'd my brushes go? grab those again shall we if i'm using if i'm using my basic brushes here and i'm rendering the uh the highlighting along him and i do too much let's say i did too much right here and i wanted to cut back into it well that's what's so brilliant about photoshop and it, it's basically oil painting without the mess you can make 100 percent opaque marks one on top of the other black on top of white on top of blue on top of red and you won't have any um, see through unless of course you you lower your opacity um, and having my flats always in the layer beneath my active color layer allows me no matter what to just uh, I just deselected so uh oh uh oh now now I'm out now I'm outside the uh, now I'm going outside the marks well it's easy enough to just grab that area again It's easy enough to just grab that area and right. then rework on that spot. And let's say I added too much highlight. I can just cut back into it. I can just cut back in like this. Yeah. So that's why having my two colors selected over here, a simple way to hop back and forth between them is the X key or whatever hot key you have selected for that. And it just allows you to go back and forth between the two. And that's key for just cutting back into the work, cutting into it, 
Um, again, this is sort of like oil painting, but without any of the mess. And it's just a lot more clean and, and sort of perfect looking. You see, I can, I can cut into stuff. Um, and, and deciding that I'm gonna have a main light source, which is generally um, a less exciting light. I'm not gonna say it's warm or cool, but it's typically the less exciting light. And then your bounced light or your secondary light source, that's gonna be the more saturated one. And that's gonna help define your figure because it's, it, it, that's the exciting light source. And it's something you can kind of play with and have fun with. I was using pink here and I maybe even could have pushed it. I maybe could have pushed, um, I'm going to talk about some of that with my own painted work here in a moment when I show you that, uh, because that secondary exciting light source that's typically quite saturated is, uh, is a really fun way to define your forms. Wow. This is awesome, man. Like, I'm like, I feel like I haven't been talking that much because you've been doing so well, just kind of explaining the whole process. This is great. You know, yeah, uh, I, I, I told you, I'm not, I'm no stranger to talking about my work. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, nope. And let's let can we actually uh, is it possible to pause this recording and then and then come back in like a minute or two here? Yeah. All right, so we're back. You know, we took a little break, but uh, yep, then we're gonna get back in. Um, you know, Brendan's gonna talk to us. You know, a little bit about his other art. You know, some stuff outside of comics that he does, and also a little bit about Grendel, um, which uh, I'm really excited to hear about. And take it away. Right on. Well, yeah, here, I'm just going to hop back into the screen sharing mode so we can, I can show some of the work I've been doing. Now, I got some really cool books coming down the pipeline. Um, Drew and I were talking about that during the break, uh, but um, I can't really talk about them yet. While I'm waiting for said books to arrive uh, for coloring, um, I have opened my commission list. And I did this last year around the same time. And it's it's fun thing to do for like a month, a year or so, um, I think it's easy to get sort of lost in doing commission work and then you're never making book work. And the point of keeping up with the book work is, is it a, it's something that's long lasting. It's sort of forever, you know, um, even though the commission work is damn fun. So I have my commission list open right now and I'm doing a number of painted works. Um, I do these mostly digitally. Uh, every now and then I get a request for something that is traditionally drawn, inked, uh, marker rendered, paint rendered, ink wash rendered. But, um, but in general, I like to paint digitally these days. And I got into digitally painting because I got into digitally coloring. I was digitally coloring before I was digitally painting, but um, I was seeing, I was starting to feel really comfortable making marks digitally using my Wacom tablet using the little pen. Um, my hand eye screen association was starting to get to a point that was uh, on par with or even more comfortable than uh, pen and paper, which was, you know, I grew up, I grew up with pen and paper. Um, so nowadays I like to do it digitally and it just gives me a certain freedom to in the early stages, especially uh, fuss with the shapes. Um, move stuff around, get that nice composition set so that when I do start to render it uh, in, a, in a sort of classically oil painter trained style, um, all, the, all the parts are there and look, look nice. Um, so let me here, I'll sh start screen sharing. Get back into Photoshop here. I'll bring up, uh, here's, here's a commission that I just completed. For, um, for a fella, he wanted a Madman piece. And this is a beloved character um, and Madman's creator, um, uh, Mike Allred is, is actually a family friend of ours. He's a local and I've known him, you know, since I could walk. So doing, um, doing this piece was sort of an honor and, um, and I put a, little, put a little extra oomph into it. Um, <clears throat> Looks great. And this piece you can see actually did end up having a lot of layers, but the layers are pretty simple. You know, this, this is like the madman layer. This is the, the symbol on his chest layer. This is the gloves layer and keeping this stuff all in its own layer does allow me to move it around if I want. Um, let's say the gloves needed moving or they needed, uh, maybe this one was too small and needed, needed making bigger. 
Um, that's all really nice to have in Photoshop, that freedom. But keeping it just as one, one chunky layer um, also promotes uh, just being bold with your decisions. When I make a mark, it's going to cover up the previous marks and there's no going back i'm i'm doing what you know what they hate in the photo editing world i'm destructive editing here i'm <laughs> yeah. i'm i'm just laying marks on top of marks and i'm but but what that does is it frees you up a little bit it allows you to just be bold with your decision making um let's see if i got another uh piece here that's perhaps less layers boom this piece is was very few layers uh this is a this was a paul Atreides commission from the recent Dune series. Um, I was a big fan of the movie, so I was excited to do this piece. Um, oh, yeah. And this one was really simple. It's it's just the figure and the background. And I started by, by laying in a very simple background using big, chunky, hard-edged brushes. And I just laid in this big, chunky, nice, sort of abstract, simple background, um, subtle and simple. And then I started chunking in the figure. Now the figure just started as one big, easy to work with silhouette. I think there was an under sketch to begin with. I had done some really simple um, sketch uh, underneath to just help me retain the, the look of it. But the under sketch that I do usually goes away very fast. And the piece is usually painted in, um, in, chunky shapes rather than in uh, terms of line and contour. I'm focusing more on the weight of large shapes. And that's just sort of more of a classic painter way to, to do things. So this Paul figure started much like this here as just a chunky shape. Uh, that chunky shape is easy to select and then work entirely within. Um, allowing me to then chunk out other other shapes and other paths for these for these uh, for these shapes and for these planes. You're you're really just helping to define planar changes where where light is hitting something more. Um, and so this is basically how I paint. And uh, and these are a few of the recent commissions. Um, my commission list is still open for a bit. So if any of your listeners want to get on my commission list, they actually, they got to hit me up pretty soon because it's, it's over in uh, the new year with the new year. That's incredible how you just did that, you know, just, you know, little by little, it just starts looking like the figure. Cause at first you were doing like, you know, a little circle and then it was like, wait, what are you, what are you doing? And then I, I realized, wait, he's literally doing, you know, showing me his process of, you know, yep. shaping it up. That, that was awesome, man. Like just, you know, <laughs> just to see how quickly all of a sudden, you know, you got those two greens you know, the figure starts to show up is, is right. awesome. Right. And, you know, if we want to then like, if you start thinking about the face and the hair and stuff. So if we have that selected and we're like, okay, the face, the face exists kind of, or the skin exists kind of in this realm. There's a big ear right here. Kind of comes down right there. And then if, um, if I unselect, then I can go outside of it and I can start to put in the hair, right? Wow. <laughs> Photoshop's really easy to chunk in shapes like this. And oh, totally, yeah. Working this way is actually pretty simple. And I think anyone could really do it if they just sort of apply these simple stylistic um, techniques. Um, it, it will limit you in certain ways, but, um, but what's nice is you can always like cover stuff up. Like I said, you can always work stuff back in. If I make a highlight here, that's too big on the cheek, I can work it back in. If I make a highlight on the ear, that's too big. I can work it back in. I can even make it work to my advantage to where now it's a nice little rounded shape. I like what you said before, how like, you know, um, you know, coloring and just drawing in Photoshop, it's, it's, you know, all the fun stuff of doing, you know, these traditional, you know, pieces, but no mess, you know what I mean? I, and I, I agree. It's like, I like seeing the industry kind of change, you know, more people are going digital, less people are doing the traditional style. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Like, what, what do you think, like, uh, 
what do you think about just have you ever done any coloring where it's you know non-digital or would you ever go back yeah or? yeah when i when i first started um coloring other people's work i was obviously illustrating still um i never stopped illustrating i've never stopped illustrating so at the time before i was painting this way i was scanning my own work the way i was receiving inked work uh, the way that others were doing to hire me to color it and i was coloring it in a similar way i was scanning my own uh pencil like line art pencil drawn and then inked piece and then erased pencils i would scan that and then i would start to color it the same way where i would put the inked line art in its own layer on multiply and then i would work beneath that layer and color within the lines um, but i found that there was a disconnect it didn't quite look as cohesive as i wanted it to it didn't quite look as cohesive as the stuff that i was doing on other people's line art and i think that was largely due to the fact that i was just spending too much time in photoshop not enough time on paper and those line artists that work on paper they they're always working on paper so they're just they they think that they're they're trying to craft such a perfect image that that they're familiar with their work being scanned. They know that, you know, it's gonna look a certain way when it's scanned versus the drawing. And I'm not quite there yet. I haven't I haven't scanned endless pieces of my work and seen it reproduced and published somewhere. So there's a bit of a disconnect. Um, and my work wasn't quite looking as cohesive as I wanted it to. So that's why I started to paint this way. I started to chunk in shapes. I of course had seen, you know, speed, speed line artists, speed painters, like there's tons of videos for this kind of stuff online. Uh, you can see, you can watch tutorials on, on guys painting very much like how I'm painting here, but like more effectively, uh, you know, I'm not even that great at this, but they, they would paint in, and, and I would watch those videos and they were super helpful. Um, that I, I highly implore you to, to go check them out if, uh, if you are oh, yeah. trying to learn how to paint this way. Um, <clears throat> Because again, I'm not I'm not a self-professed uh, like painting master at this. There's a lot of guys that I follow right now that I'm sort of emulating. Um, there's a fella who paints traditionally that paints sort of this way in these big chunky shapes. His name is Nick uh, uh, Pellegrino. Uh, Rich Rich Pellegrino, check him out. He's awesome. Oh yeah, definitely. You write that name out. Yes, Rich Pellegrino illustration. This um, this is what his little icon looks like on this. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I'll and he does very out. chunky paints, and and I love the way he paints. Um, but I'm I'm painting um, you know, uh, this chunky paint style. This all really comes from sort of turn of the century painters, um, illustrators that uh, like N. C. Wyeth, uh, guys who were doing big bold. Um, graphic storytelling images, fantasy images. Um, we can thank these guys for a lot of the fantasy imagery we have today. Um, and I'm definitely, they're a huge influence on the way that I paint digitally now. Um, here's a fun piece. This was for uh, Kingdom, the Netflix series, which I oh, yeah, was yeah. so extremely enamored by. Um, this was just a fun piece. This actually wasn't a commission. This was just a fun piece that I just did. Just for fun, uh, okay. Yep, I was in the middle of doing commissions and this was to keep the hand moving. And uh, yeah, pretty cool piece. I feel uh, like that's important. Like when you're, you know, you're an artist in any field, like, you know, is it still fun? Cause like I've talked to people that, you know, were, you know, professional artists and they were like, I had to leave because I just wasn't enjoying the work anymore. So I think, you know, obviously it's, it's important to still love the work, you know, outside of commissions. My aunt, uh, my other auntie on my mom's side, I have two aunts, the one editor, uh, the other is uh, a former um, animator for film and TV and she just wasn't having fun with the work. So she's now a nurse. Oh, wow. And she, she worked on some pretty amazing stuff. She worked on Mars Attacks and, and um, oh, wow. Uh, uh, Harry Potter, um, Iron Man, um, uh, Star Wars, uh, tons of stuff. Um, she, uh, rich rich resume of, of incredible work and she just wasn't enjoying it so she became a nurse you gotta enjoy it yeah definitely well uh, uh let's... i'm gonna share one more piece here and this is the piece that i'm currently in the middle of this oh, is wow. a book cover uh sci-fi book cover for a um 
for a former studio mate. She hit me up. She uh, is a writer and she has a new sci-fi book coming out and she needs a cover or back image or something. Okay. I think it's a cover though, because it's going to have a title on it. Um, no, nope. I'm not going to turn the title on because I don't want to spoil it for her, but here oh, is okay. the under image. Um, and this too is, uh, it started as a pretty basic, um, let's see if I can find it really quick. This too started as a, uh, there you go. Started as a, a under sketch and it has changed. See? Oh, gotcha. Okay. There's sort of a little bit of the, you can see the process there. Um, but this is where the image is currently at. And after we hang up here, I will be spending the rest of the day painting this sucker. And that just cool. means more detail, more uh, exaggerated lighting, um, more contrast. Uh, all of these green floating balls will be eyeballs, for example. Um, so yeah, pretty fun piece. Dragon. <laughs> This has um, a, a bunch of layers going right now, but you know, once I'm happy with where certain things are at, I will compress oh, yeah. these layers. The planets will all compress, the dragon and, and all that detail will all compress. Um, you know, currently it's I'm trying to figure out some of the stuff that's laying on top of other stuff. So, but like this layer, for example, that I keep turning on and off, this this will be compressed. I'll just, you know, once I'm satisfied with a shape or something, I want to compress it because then once it's compressed and it's in one thing then I can start to fuss with the levels on it as a whole, as a whole object. Oh, yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? And once, once, uh, and so it's always good to keep compressing stuff. It, when, when you have all these different layers and all these things, if you change one, like if I were to affect the layer, the adjustment levels on this one layer right now, the dragon layer, I'd have to then go do it on the other layers, right? Yeah. So like compressing it is nice because then you can work on stuff um, as it's a, as a whole. And you always want to be thinking about the whole. You always want to be zooming out and, you know, reminding yourself of the whole image and what is important because it's very easy in digital painting and in digital art to get lost in little focused in details, be obsessing over, you know, little minute details here and there when really, you know, you zoom out and it's like, what, what matters? What is the whole? And what's helping to tell the story? remember especially as a colorist gotcha yep uh, uh just one one kind of uh thing real quick i wanted to ask you just out of curiosity like uh, you know with marvel dc do you have any like favorite characters like you know now you worked on batman you've done a couple you know covers now in some interior stuff what um what kind of like who's your favorite kind of superhero do you have a favorite or is it favorite superhero yeah. Do you have a favorite superhero, or like favorite character? Oh yeah. Okay. My aunt, this is uh, this is a great question, and I and I uh, I've over the years trying to formulate the answer um, to be a little bit more complex than what it is. Which the the true answer is um, I don't like superheroes. <laughs> okay. That, yeah, I'm not I've heard a, a lot superhero of guy. Um, okay. If you look at the majority of my art, uh, painted art, um, solo art, uh, and and the books that I'm starting to work on, they're actually more fantasy, sci-fi, horror, um, those genres cool. are my, th those are my core three. And uh, uh, superhero fiction, there are, there are vigilantes and usually superhero characters and heroic figures and characters in those three genres that I just mentioned, fantasy, sci-fi, horror. But um, specifically spandex, like her heroic fiction is what you're referring to, right? Like yeah, yeah. Stuff. And I'm generally not, not as into it. Um, I grew up reading some of it, but um, uh, the short answer is I'm not, I'm not that into it. I don't read, I don't read uh, superhero comics. I think, yeah, I, I kind of, I could tell like, uh, you, you're not probably like, you, I, I don't see you as the type of guy like going to a comic shop every week and picking up new comics. Like, you know, you're. No, no. And, and I, I generally like graphic novels more anyway, but yeah, I like, right. I like the indie stuff and I like, um, and man, most comic book artists will tell you this. At the end of the day, I don't read a bunch of comic books. I, I like yeah. I stare at comic books and I help make comic books all day. And I'm usually looking at and reading chunks of comic books for research. And so at the end of the day, I don't want to sit down and read a whole comic book. I just don't. I, uh, I generally want to like eat a nice meal and watch a television show uh, like most people do. I want to turn on Netflix. I want to like kind of turn my brain off a little bit. And I want to watch, I want to watch a, a show, a series. Um, totally. Yeah. 
and that's a good lead in here. Uh, there is a series come up I'm, I'm very excited to talk about, and that oh, yeah, is yeah. the Grendel Netflix series. So Grendel has yeah. recently been uh, picked up by Netflix. Here I am wearing an official Grendel Netflix sweatshirt with a season one on the back. Sweet. Uh, Grendel, uh, I'm not sure what the air date is. They have, they don't have one yet. Um, but filming is underway and it is going, uh, strong. And, uh, from what I've seen, it looks awesome. Um, I actually cool. got to play a small role in helping to adjust and sort of fine tune the designs on the mask and the costume. Uh, uh, my father and I, we wanted to make sure that they were getting it right. We got some early samples of what it looked like, and we had a say in um, in helping to micro adjust and fine tune so that it so that it really looks um, good on on screen, but will will uh, satisfy the fans of of the comic book. Because cool. at the end of the day, that's you know or we got totally, to yeah. please those people. Now, was that like surreal, that experience? Like, wow, this is like a real thing like happening. Oh, like, oh yeah. And it's, and it's <laughs> continuing to feel more so. I imagine, I imagine as the months roll on here and we get closer to, to a trailer and stuff, it's going to really start to feel more, um, more realistic. Uh, uh, I got to sit in on a table read and it was thrilling. <laughs> awesome. Uh, awesome. Yeah. That's so, that's so cool. Man. Like I've heard you talk in other interviews how like, uh, you know, you look at Grendel more as like your other sibling. You know, because you've <laughs> yeah yeah you know you I said like these people yeah like I I thought that was kind of interesting you know and it, it it's Definitely cool to see to <laughs> it's cool like that you know it's something you and your dad you know both kind of did together and now that works kind of become its own thing in other media um that's awesome and I like um I mean the indie comic scene is now really getting into tv and, and film you know between the boys and all these other you know oh, i love the boys the boys is great yeah. it's it's cool that it's not just the big two anymore now you know anything can be on the table any indie yeah. comic i think that's great yeah. you know what are your thoughts on that you know just that that shift that trend um yeah and i i'm liking a lot of that stuff uh you know there's there's some pushback on some of it um and and everyone's very opinionated these days i i generally am these days under this sort of like, uh, I'm, I'm going into shows less critical than I used to. I think I used to watch television and, and, and it had to impress me. And I sat down being so critical and judgmental and, and predisposed to almost dislike it. And now I'm kind of flipped. I'm predisposed to like stuff now. I, I want to like stuff. I want it to be good. I want to give it the benefit of the doubt. Cause, um, and I didn't talk about this in the interview, but my wife is a, uh, 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 CG artist. She she does uh, comp work for film and TV. She's incredibly successful at this, working on stuff like Rogue One and Hereditary and her incredible films. And uh, and seeing the work that she does, that she puts in, the the tireless hours, the the uh, and, and her her workmates and talking to them, seeing the amount of love that they pour into this stuff that we're so critical of, and they love it because because it, it takes a lot of work to produce this stuff. I see how much work it takes to produce a comic book and people are highly critical of that. And there, there's so much more so of film and TV and it's so much work. And so I want to give it the benefit yeah. of that. I want, I want to like it. And so um, I generally like this stuff these days. I don't watch that much superhero like right. uh, movies anymore. I've kind of fallen off of those, to be honest. Like I didn't see Eternals yet or Shang, Shang Chi or anything. I, I, I kind of want to see them, I guess. Um, yeah. I, I like the boys. Uh, I liked Umbrella Academy a lot. Um, uh, uh, I'm currently watching Yellow Jackets, which is awesome. <laughs> oh, cool! <laughs> Showtime yeah, series, out, yeah. great. Um, uh, yeah, but as far as 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 the film and TV comic scene, like I'm all for it, especially the indie stuff, because a lot of this stuff, like my dad here getting his getting his dues over the years. You know, he's seen a lot of his peers have their properties turn to film and TV and turn into these little gold mines for them and and he's he's sort of been waiting for his over the years because grendel is is uh one of the first independently published uh, comic books in in the states and uh oh, wow. and certainly the first to have like a sprawling legacy like this and um so and yeah you, if you look into it you'll see the history goes back quite quite a bit on that one um same with mage and i was fortunate enough to color the latest uh and final uh, installment of the Mage trilogy, um, 
he put 15 years in between each installment of Mage, and um, that really gave him perspective. And so the final Mage installment, uh, very autobiographical, features um, him and his children, who are effectively me and my sister in comic book form. So uh, that's cool. yeah, it's a very cool book. Um, highly recommend that one, especially if you're into Arthurian legends and the and the oh, sort yeah, of classic um, hero's tale and the journey of the hero. Yeah, definitely check that out. Well, hey, man, I'm, I'm going to wrap this up. I really appreciate you, you know, taking the time to talk to me. Um, you know, definitely. maybe we'll do this again sometime. Uh, I really like your work. You know, I'll definitely, I definitely want to check out Grendel. I'm excited for that show. Uh, it's all of it, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yep. I want to encourage your, uh, your listeners to pick up uh, uh, Batman the Long Halloween Special Nightmares in stores now. It's, uh, I'm really proud of it. And, um, and it's, it's perfect uh, holiday read. So go get it. Definitely.